Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we lift up your name with hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord, my God. Hosanna in the highest glory, glory, glory to the King of Kings. Glory, glory, glory to the King of Kings. Lord, we lift up your name. Good morning, church. Welcome to Northside. We are glad you're here. Um, uh, Well, let's come back to that video in just a moment. Um, If you are here in person or joining us online, we're thrilled to be with you today. Uh, Take out your smartphone or tablet and go to nscoc.org slash connect. Share with us your prayer requests, praises. Let us know what's going on in your life. How can we be praying for you and with you this week. If you're online, um, say hello in the chat section and let us know you're here. Uh, If you'd like to pray with someone, we have hosts ready to pray with you right now. Uh, You can follow along with today's service on your mobile device by visiting nscoc.org slash uversion, or you can scan that code and that will take you right to it. The uversion event has song lyrics, sheet music, scripture readings, announcements, and more. If you're new with us today, we are especially glad you're here. Thank you for choosing to spend your Sunday morning with us. We hope we can be a blessing to you. As we continue our worship, would you stand with me, and would you join me uh, in this reading on the bold words? Rejoice greatly, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, even on a donkey's colt. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let all Israel repeat, His His faithful faithful love love endures endures forever. Open for me the gates where the righteous enter, and I will go in and thank the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. You are our God, and we will praise you. You are our God and we will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let's pray together. Giver of life, your faithful love endures forever. Open our hearts to the blessed one who comes so humbly on a borrowed colt. 
Open before us the gates of your justice, that we may enter, confessing in heaven and on earth that Jesus is Lord. Amen. Let's sing together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All glory, Lord, and honor to the Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children make sweet hosannas ring. Thou art the King of Israel, thou David's royal Son, who in the Lord's name comes, the King and Blessed One, the company of
your glorious name. You call my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious name. You call my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious name. Would you be seated, please? I cast my mind on Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, Jesus makes all oh, praise
Good morning. Friday was the five-year anniversary of our first ever Loaves and Fishes run. So we just want to celebrate this morning five years of, of being the hands and feet of Jesus. And if you're not familiar with what Loaves and Fishes is, or this ministry, we provide food, hygiene items, socks, Bibles, to the homeless and economically disadvantaged community in San Antonio. So pre-COVID, the estimate was there were about 3,000 homeless people in San Antonio. We have far exceeded that now. Um, you'll, if you just pay attention, you'll see camps and tent cities popping up everywhere. When it's cold weather, we also provide coffee, hats, gloves, blankets, um, jackets, sweatshirts, whenever we can. We run three times a week. So the Monday evening run goes to Nolan Street, which is at the, under the bridge at 37 and Nolan Street, and then on to Garcia Park. Thursdays and Saturdays are lunchtime runs, and we go just to Garcia Park. We pray for folks, we get to share the love of Jesus, and we develop relationships with people. In the last five years, we've served about 130,000 meals to people. We also got to serve the first responders during Hurricane Harvey. So many people were coming to San Antonio and staging here that it took a while for the system to catch up and actually provide food. So we had the opportunity to do that. But I think we made a, the, the most significant impact to folks during COVID. It's just two years ago now that basically the nation shut down. And so with that, shelters closed, soup kitchens closed, churches that were providing food just shut down. And virtually in San Antonio, we were about the only ministry out there still serving people. And, uh, and our numbers surged. It was, it was a challenge to continue to feed that many people. We far exceeded the capacity of our truck. But through God's strength, we found a way to make it happen. And so we, um, we're proud that we were able to be a light in the world of darkness at that time. And by the way, not a single one of our volunteers contracted COVID from serving people. You know, the impact we have on people sometimes is hard to tell. We get little glimpses now and then, but really this ministry plants seeds. And then we rely on God to grow people and others probably get to harvest the results of that. But we're happy just planting those seeds. That we know of, we literally have saved three lives. We've, we've encountered people during cold weather where they were just soaked to the bones and, and just extremely hypothermic. And we were able to provide coffee, give them dry clothes, put some emergency blankets on them. And frequently, our own volunteers just took their own jackets off and gave them to people so they'd have some dry clothing. Um, when you remember somebody's name, it makes them feel seen and valued. And this, we're serving the marginalized community that basically most of our society wants to not see. These people feel invisible most of the time. And so we get to serve them while they're probably at the lowest point in their life. But just remembering a name helps so much. We've gotten to celebrate with people as they've got a job, as they've become sober, as they've moved into an apartment. And we've helped some people provide basic pots and pans when they move into an apartment with nothing. Or uh, we went over to the Salvation Army and bought a dining room table and chairs just so people would have some place to sit when they do start getting reestablished. One of the ladies that we had the privilege of meeting, her name was Shirley, and she was pregnant while we were feeding. And she told us multiple times that the food we were providing was the only thing keeping her baby alive and, and growing. And then she, uh, once she had the baby, she and her precious little girl moved into an apartment, and she came back to visit us one day when we were serving so we could meet that precious gift from God. So we, we get to serve people and, and do that. Now, I want to focus for a few minutes on the impact serving has had on me. This ministry, um, through this ministry, God continues to stretch me and to grow me. I realize how much excess we have. Uh, one Saturday, we're out serving lunch, and I was getting hungry, and we were wrapping things up, and I thought, oh, thank goodness we're almost done because I'm starving. And that's when God sent a man to the truck who was so grateful to get a bag of food because he hadn't eaten in four days. 
And I just thought, you know, I am so spoiled. I have so much. I do not know what it is to really be hungry or to be starving. Because I missed a meal maybe once or twice in my life doesn't mean that I'm starving. I've also come to value the community that I, uh, <clears throat> that I have, whether it's my biological family, friends, or my church family. As I talk to people that we have the opportunity to serve, I realized that the events that brought, him, brought them to this home, point of homelessness are normal life events that happen to all of us. The difference is they had no community to serve as their safety net to catch them when they lost their job, when they got sick, or when other life events happened. Amanda's one lady that sticks in my mind. She and her four or three young boys moved to San Antonio for her job. And then after they'd been here just a month or two, she lost her job, so they lost the ability to have a place to live, so they became homeless. Adam's a man that we met as we were first starting. He was just coming back from a deployment overseas, he was a Marine, for over a year, and when he got back home, he found that his wife had become addicted to drugs and sold everything they had to support her habit, so he was out on the streets. Irish is a man that Got hit. He was working. He got hit by a truck, and through his year of surgeries and physical therapy, he lost his job. We become, became aware of a group of college students who were going to a community college here in town, and they were working, but they only earned enough money to pay for tuition and food. And so they decided their education was, it, was worth it and that they were just living in their car instead of uh, paying rent. I've also learned to trust God more. I'm a planner. You know, I like to have a plan and know exactly who's going to show up and who's going to go to town and know that things are going to go smoothly. And this ministry just doesn't support my desire for control. And so, uh, so God just continues to amaze me because he provides just what's needed when it's needed, whether it's volunteers that show up or donations or money to, to do what's needed. So. I'm learning to trust God more. And then finally, it just amazes me how God can orchestrate these, what I think are random events. So we've served people that have gotten beyond homelessness, gone into an apartment, and then they end up at Grant Street and outside for ministry got to continue serving them after their time with us was done. And then if this doesn't just uh, rock your world, you need to be on your knees praying. We, I told you that um, we feed a lot of pregnant women. And not all of them get to keep their babies. And it just blows me away when we find out that those babies that we got to feed while they were still being formed became part of Forever Homes with families here at Northside. And, and so, yeah. so, so we got to provide food. But now our children's ministry is feeding them spiritually. And that's something that only God can do. Serving isn't just about the people we're helping. It's about us and our spiritual growth and allowing God to spiritually form us. So if you'll remember, back on Mission Sunday, we had these personal commitment cards. And it's just a list of ways and ministries that Northside support that you can be involved in. And so if you've forgotten about this, dig it back out, or if you lost it, get another one at the kiosk, and put it on your fridge to remind yourself God wants you out there serving. He's commanded us to serve people and to serve others. Now, if you are um, here today in person, if you've participated in any way with loaves and fishes in the last five years, I want you to stand up, whether it's coming to make sandwiches, serving food, boiling the eggs, doing our monthly reports, and if you're online, then, then raise your hand in the chat section so we can thank all of you. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Judy. That's an awesome ministry. And uh, I, standing in the back and seeing as many people stand up um, is absolutely uh, heartwarming. It really is to see the participation and everything. If we, we could do that on all the different ministries, man, we, we, would, be, we would be happening. Right, Sister Mary? Amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Today is a good day. It's full of good news. Today is one of those days that, as Judy mentioned, is a day that 
our God, despite this world and the mess that we're in, is still in control and he still reigns. And I'm telling you, that's good news. Good news. I have some sad news, though. Um, this was a very rough past week. We had, of, of our membership, we had five folks that lost loved ones. Uh, David Petrosky, he lost his mother. Uh, earlier in June, Presley Orsburn, his youngest brother. Vicki Holland, her sister. And Angie Gill uh, lost her mom and also the grandmother to my daughter-in-law, Kristen Zimmer, to Nick, their son, and Daniel Teague, and Ashley. So it was, it was very hard uh, to, to hear this news. Con I mean, it was, you just be, get overwhelmed after a while on it. Um, also, I got a note from Rita Campbell. Uh, she asked to be added to the prayer list as well for her situation. Uh, we'll be praying for, and also uh, just got a quick note uh, from Cindy that uh, she has some loved ones that will be traveling and asking for prayers for them. Um, what I would like to do, though, is I confess to you that sometimes the words are just hard to come up with. So I'm going to read Psalm 146 as, as our prayer and add a few words to it. So if you would, at this time, bow your heads. And as I read this, I'll continue on. Praise the Lord. Let all that I am praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God with my dying breath. Don't put confidence in powerful people. There is no help there for you. When they breathe their last, they return to the earth, and all their plans die with them. But joyful are those who have the God of Israel as their helper, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He made the heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He keeps every promise forever. He gives justice to the oppressed and food to the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are weighed down the Lord loves the godly. The Lord protects the foreigners among us. He cares for the orphans and widows, but he frustrates the plans of the wicked. The Lord will reign forever. He will be your God, O Jerusalem, throughout all the generations. Now, dear Lord, your words say that you can wipe away our tears. And so I pray you wipe away the sorrow that David and Jenny and Presley and Vicki and Angie feel at this moment in time. May their sense of feeling overwhelmed with pain and sadness right now be humbling, but Lord, please let the feeling of your presence outweigh the heaviness felt by their grief. I thank you that you heal the brokenhearted and bind up their wounds. Lord, please bind up the wounds of these beloved friends from the heartache they are experiencing and make their heart whole so that they can again feel joy in the days to come. For our sweet sister Rita, I ask and pray for your mercy that you bring about the healing that we're asking on her behalf, that we please help the doctors in the treatment plan that will kill this virus that's attacking her heart and worsening the heart failure that she's currently experiencing. We ask for complete healing of the heart and the diagnosis she's been giving and asking for long life for this sweet sister. We look for your compassion and your graciousness upon her body and her spirit. We ask that the traveling of Reese and Jason Coulterman that as they go to England, that you protect them in their travels, help them to arrive safely. Lord, there are so many, if we just spend a moment and look at our prayer list, that need your help, need your love. And we know that only happens through us. You've partnered with us, and all the grace can be ministered through us because that's the way you designed it. Help us to love on them. 
to call on them, to hug their necks, and to let them know how much they are loved because we know you love them. We thank you for this day, Father. We thank you for the time to be reminded of our Lord and of our Savior and all that he has done and the great news that he has brought through salvation. And we offer this prayer in his precious name, the most powerful name on earth, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. This morning's scripture is from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie her and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of them and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. It is my privilege to introduce some folks who are placing membership here at Northside. Um, I'm going to go in, there are uh, four different, the, the, and I'm going to go in alphabetical order. Uh, Jace and Becca Allen, who live in Jordanton, and their children, Judah, Margot, and Vera, are placing membership here with us. Are, they, are the Allens here? Could y'all stand? You see them? Yep, oh, they're right there. Let's welcome them. I knew Jace when he was just a little bitty uh, child at the Pine Tree Church in Longview, Texas. Jace, you were born in 89, right? Or before that? Okay, so I'd only been there a couple of years when you were born. I, uh, Jace and, uh, Jace's parents were, uh, were members there and I knew their family, so we're glad that Jace and Becca were with us. They've recently come back from the mission fields. So we wanna uh, be there for them in that. Uh, Eric and Betty uh, Bollock, who live in Encino Cedros here, just right near the building. They're both retired. They come to us from the Garden Ridge Church of Christ. Eric and Betty, can you stand? Right here, let's welcome them. God bless y'all. Uh, Cindy Bland, who lives on Encino Knoll here in San Antonio. She's a retired teacher. Cindy used to be a member here. She's placing her membership with us again. Cindy, would you stand so we could recognize you? Right here, God bless you. And Nancy Holloway, Holloway who lives on Long Branch Run, uh, she works with the Air Alamo Area Council of Governments uh, as an ADRC specialist. I don't know what that is. It, it sounds very impressive, and I look forward to getting to know uh, what that is. She comes to us from the Westover Hills Church of Christ. Nancy, would you please stand? Right here. God bless you. Man, it's been a good day, hasn't it? Amen. Amen. I uh, want to remind you that shepherd recognition is going on right now, the deadline uh, for submitting recommendations uh, for men to be shepherds of this church is tomorrow. Uh, and so you need to do that today or tomorrow. Uh, you can go to our website to go to the, on the resource tab, drop down and it'll say shepherd recognition. You can do it all online. Uh, there are paper uh, forms out at the information kiosk if you would like to do that. Uh, but that's, uh, that happens, that the deadline's tomorrow. So we wanted to make you aware of that. Also want to let you know that Good Friday, this coming Friday, uh, we're going to have a Good Friday service in the youth room. Uh, we will not be having anything Wednesday night this week, but we will have a Tenebrae service uh, or a modified Tenebrae service on uh, Friday night. Uh, we did these several of these before COVID, 
Uh, it is, uh, tenebrae means, is Latin, it means shadow or darkness. Uh, and it is a, it's a, a service that moves from sound to silence and from light to darkness. Um, there are candles involved. We're going to have a cappella worship and also some unobtrusive instrumentation as well uh, to help us worship on Friday night. So that's from 7 to 8, at 7 to 8 p.m. in the youth room. So we want to invite you to come be with us uh, on Good Friday for that. And then, of course, on Sunday, we celebrate Easter. And if you have not yet uh, picked up a couple of these uh, invite cards, be sure and do so today. Invite your friends to come be with us on Easter Sunday. You know, sometimes in life, things don't turn out the way we expect. Would you agree with that? This happened to Kim and I one time when we were on an anniversary trip. We went to Fort Davis. This is actually one of our most favorite trips to do, to drive out there, to go see Alpine, go see the A, the true value hardware that where, where uh, uh, Maynard used to, to, to serve them. And, and we go to Alpine, then go to Fort Davis. We go to the McDonald Observatory, uh, go through the, all the tours that they have because I'm a, I'm a science geek and a space geek, and I love all that. And we view the sun live. And in the evening, they have something called a star party where you, you go from station to station and you look through telescopes at different uh, stars and, and, and things in the skies. It's just a lot of fun. It's a late night, but it's, it's just a lot of fun. So this was a, an anniversary trip for us, uh, you know, kind of a romantic, scientific uh, holiday, you might say. Uh, and we stayed at a little hotel in downtown uh, Fort Davis, and, and it was unusual because I think it was one of the first times I'd had a hotel with one of these magnetic key cards, you know, uh, where they, they do that. Well, I had my key card in my, the pocket of my shirt all day long. Uh, what was also in the park, pocket of my shirt was a, my magnetized uh, eyeglass clips and the, the holder, the holder for the eyeglass, the sunglass clips, all that in there. And so I don't know, it was past 11 o'clock. We're headed back to the hotel. Uh, we go up to the room. T two things surprised me. Number one, there was no one at the desk. All the help in the hotel went home at night. There was no one there. And the other thing that surprised me is that my key would not work because the magnets had demagnetized the strip that was supposed to open the lock. So I went, there was a phone downstairs, and so I thought, now called the, whoever owned the hotel. The guy was convinced I was drunk because he kept trying, I'm just convinced that he, because he kept trying to explain to me how to use the key card. I said, sir, I know how to use the key card. Uh, it's, it's, it won't work, it will not work. And the other thing I learned, here's a pro tip. If they give you two key cards, t take both of them, okay? <laughs> Because we didn't that night. We left one in the room. Uh, and so we spent most of that night, they, they were going to come and help us and let us in. We spent most of that night in the hallway of the hotel. Things just didn't turn out like we expected. And maybe you can relate to that. Uh, maybe you, you planned a wonderful vacation, but the plans fell through or didn't turn out like you thought it would. Or maybe you bought a car and it ended up being something you had to repair all the time. Or you bought a little fixer-upper house and it ended up being kind of a, a money pit. Or maybe the dating was great and, may, and the engagement was even better, but the marriage has not been what you thought it would be. Sometimes things don't turn out as we expect. And I'll tell you that that was true for the crowds of people who gathered in Jerusalem to welcome Jesus into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. They, things did not go as they expected. Brian Hickman read our scripture passage this morning from Matthew chapter 21. Jesus rode into Jerusalem. He met this huge crowd of people who had come from all over the world to celebrate the Passover feast. Now, you, you need to kind of get the, the picture here. Jerusalem, probably at this day, this time in history, was a city of maybe, maybe about 50,000. That's what some scholars say. And what they say is that when on these annual feast days like Passover, the city would swell with pilgrims who had come to worship. And so there could be as many as 2 million people in Jerusalem on this particular day. Passover was an annual feast and a holiday that celebrated God's deliverance of the Jews from Egyptian slavery. So, the, so this was a big, big deal. 
This was a celebration of freedom, deliverance. It was a celebration that honored God. National political feelings were always at a fever pitch at Passover, and there was tension in the city because the Roman Empire was in charge of the world, and the Jews wanted the Romans out. Now, the Romans allowed Israel to worship the way they wanted to, and they also allowed them to maintain various forms of government and religious leadership in the land. And so King Herod and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin, the council, they had power and control over Israel, but the common people chafed under the rule of Roman oppression and they wanted the Romans out. You gotta keep that in mind when you think of this great crowd of people that welcomed Jesus into the city. And these people, are, they're cheering for Jesus. They're proclaiming him, in essence, they're proclaiming him as king. As far as the people were concerned, Jesus was going to deliver them from Roman oppression, much like Moses delivered Israel from the oppression of the Egyptians centuries earlier. That was the great expectation that political freedom was at hand, glory, national power, and control would soon be theirs. But things don't always turn out the way you expect. I want us to work through the text. Then I want us to think about a couple of things we need to be very careful about as disciples of Jesus. In the first three verses, something really great is happening here because Jesus, as he often did in his ministry, he's fulfilling a prophecy from the Old Testament. He's fulfilling what had been taught in the Old Testament about the coming of the Messiah, the King, the Deliverer, and the crowds were waiting. The crowds wanted the Messiah. And the rabbis and the, and the prophets had been preaching about this, this coming Messiah, Deliverer, Conquering King for centuries. And they were ready. But in all of this, they seem to have missed the point of the important prophecy. Here it is. Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. You see, their king was not the king they thought. This king was a king of gentleness and peace. That's what the foal of a donkey was all about. It signified gentleness and peace and humility. They expected their king to come riding into Jerusalem on a white horse with a sword in his hand to proclaim freedom and victory and freedom from oppression of the, of the Romans, to start a new throne. But Jesus didn't choose a war horse and he didn't bring a sword. He came in with gentleness and humility. He came to save all people, not just the Jews. That's the point of the last verse. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. He came to save everyone, not just a chosen few, but everyone. The idea is that he, Jesus came for all people, not just for the Jews, and his love is available this morning for you and I, if we will believe. And then in verses 7 through 9, this very large crowd of people responded in three ways that I think are worth noticing. First of all, it says that they laid their coats, their cloaks on the road, which is interesting because most people only owned one cloak like this or one coat, and so they're willing to put their clothes in the dirt, and this was a great act of honor that was always reserved for, something, for someone who was a king. And the ones that knew their Bible would think back to the Old Testament and they would remember another king, a king named Jehu. And Jehu was, uh, was anointed king while Joram, the son of, of, uh, of Ahab, who was a bad king and a bad king, Joram was a bad king, he was still on the throne. But the prophet anointed 
uh, anointed Jehu as king, and as they were honoring him, it says in 2 Kings chapter 9 and verse 13, they quickly took their cloaks and spread them under him on the bare steps. Then they blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. When they spread those cloaks out, it was, the, it was their way of, of proclaiming him king. Another thing they did that I think was interesting was the palm branches. Matthew says they cut leaves off of trees. John is the one that tells us that they were palm branches because in the long history and tradition of Jerusalem, stories had been told about a national hero named Judas Maccabeus. Now, not to be confused with the Judas Iscariot that ended up betraying Jesus. This is Judas Maccabeus. 200 years before Jesus, Judas Maccabeus led an uprising in Israel to conquer the, the oppressors that were oppressing Israel at that time. And when Judas Maccabeus came into the city of Jerusalem, they cut palm branches and they put them on the ground and they held them up because they were proclaiming him as their deliverer. So Jesus comes into Jerusalem and he is viewed as the next Judas Maccabeus, the conquering hero. And as he arrived, anxious government leaders saw what the people were doing and they plot, began to plot right then to do away with him. Then there's a third thing that they do, which is interesting. They, they sing royal songs to Jesus. Hosanna to the son of, Jesus, uh, son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. You know what Hosanna means? It means save me in Hebrew. It means save me. Save us. Save us. They're not talking save us from our sins. That's not what they're saying. They're saying save us from oppression. Save us from the, the heel of the Roman army that is on our necks. Deliver our city, deliver our nation, bring us back. They recognized he was the son of David and they knew the king, the Messiah, would come from the, the line of David. And so they're asking him to save them. Now here's the great irony in all this. All these people who on Palm Sunday are praising Jesus would be booing him on Friday when he hung on the cross. They were right in the beginning. He was the right one. He was the guy. The great question was, what sort of king would he be? And Jesus knew he would not be the king they expected. He rode into Jerusalem not to be enthroned like David, or welcomed like Judas Maccabeus, he came into the city to be killed. But the people wanted a king. They wanted a war hero. They wanted their freedom. And the same crowd that welcomed him on Sunday put him on a cross on Friday. So what do we learn? I think there are a couple of things. First, I think we need to be very careful how we think about and consider power. Because you see, our temptation is the same temptation that the Jews faced on this day. Our temptation is to try to use the ways of the world, power, control, might, and force to accomplish the will of God. That's our temptation. Christians want to seize power through political means to try to accomplish God's will. But that is not God's way. I thought it was interesting this morning, I read an article about how the Russian Orthodox Church is backing Putin and what Putin is doing in Ukraine. And I thought, how could it be that religious people could ever join themselves to something like that? 
You see, Jesus is not about power and control. Jesus is not about top-down forcing people into some type of conformity. Jesus is about loving people and caring for them and showing them that there's a better way to live. See, I think we face that same danger. We really do. To, to meld religion and politics. To think that if we could just get the right guy in office, then we would be able to accomplish the will of God. But that is not the way of God. Amen. He came in humble and gentle. He wasn't what they expected at all. And then I think another thing we need to, to do is we need to be careful how we think about and consider prayer. Amen. And let me try to make this connection. Um, I tend to turn to God for help in those times when I have a need. That makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, God cares about my needs and he cares about me and he's told me that I should pray and that I should ask him for help. And so we pray when we pray. What a great prayer, by the way, today, Tom. What a great way to lead us through prayer. Um, we have needs and we are so deeply concerned for one another and for our wellness. And, and so we will pray and we will pray and ask God to heal our loved ones. And we pray and we ask God to, to, you know, to, to, to help us to, to, uh, accomplish things financially in life. We want, we, we want to be able to, to have the money to live. And we, we hear these stories about the people who are on the street and with loaves and fishes, and we're thankful that we're helping them. But, but it, it is, I think, Judy's so very right that it's just a, many of us sometimes, are, we're just a, an event away. And, and so we pray for, to God to, to help us with all of those things. The people on this particular Sunday, they, they wanted help from the Messiah. They wanted him to deliver them. Uh, in fact, I think, you know, I think the most common prayer in the world could probably be summed up in one word. And that one word is help. Help. Now, now, now these people wanted a prophet to give them answers. They wanted a king. They wanted a conqueror. But Jesus had different plans. He was not so much concerned about their surface level needs, the need to kick the Romans out. Now don't misunderstand me here. God cares about our surface level needs. He cares that we have food on the table, that we have clothes to wear, he cares that we, are, we, we can pray for healing and that we are healed. But folks, that's surface level stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are other things below all of that that are more important. Things like trust yes, yes, and faith and love. I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm not saying God doesn't care about the surface level stuff, but I'm just saying he's more concerned about your spiritual growth and your development and that you begin to trust him and have faith in him in every circumstance. He's more concerned about that than whether or not some of these other things are immediately taken care of. And I'll tell you, in, in my life, when, when the surface level stuff isn't dealt with, my, my temptation is to, is to think that God is absent, that God does not care. But it may be that in those moments, God's working on something yes, way deeper yes, yes. than I could ever understand, at least in the moment. I think we need to be careful about how we think about and consider prayer. God is not a cosmic vending machine to give us whatever we want. Maybe we need to go deeper. 
the story of Jesus' entry in Jerusalem, one theologian put it this way, it was the, the mismatch, the great mismatch between their expectations and God's answer. Now the bad news is that the crowd standing on the street in Jerusalem on that day would be disappointed. The good news is that their disappointment would really only be at this surface level. Deep down, Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem is the answer to every question and need they ever had. And my friend, I'm telling you, it is the same truth for you. Sometimes things don't turn out as we expect. But I can promise you this, inviting Jesus into your life to rescue your heart will exceed any expectation you have ever had. Let's pray. Jesus, we welcome you. We welcome you into our lives. Not the way we want you to be here, but we welcome you the way you need to be here. I pray, Father, that, uh, and I pray, Jesus, that our expectations of you fall in line with you and not what I want. Not my will be done, but may your will be done in my life, in this church, in all of our hearts. We're so very grateful, Father, that you sent Jesus into Jerusalem on that day. We know how it turns out. And because of that, all the expectations that we have ultimately can be met in our Savior. We're thankful, Father, that in just a week from now, we'll be celebrating his resurrection. Father, help us to be filled with hope because of that. May he be risen in us every day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up and let's sing. Let the weak say I am strong, let the poor say I am rich, let the blind say I can see, it's what the Lord has done in me. Let the weak say I am strong, let the poor say say I can see it's what the Lord has done in me Hosanna Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain Hosanna Hosanna Jesus died
Let the poor say I am rich. Let the blind say I can see. It's what the Lord has done in me. Would you be seated, please? Exodus 12, 21 through 22 says, Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. The youth group just got back yesterday from our spring retreat where our theme was the break trail experience. And if you've ever gone hiking, you might know um, what breaking trail is. It's something you do when you encounter something that's too tough to navigate. When, when that happens, one hiker usually goes ahead of everyone else and they clear a way so that others can follow behind more easily. A trail breaker is someone who goes ahead, who makes a new way, and who invites others to follow along behind them. Throughout our time together this weekend, we traced the final hours of Jesus leading up to his crucifixion. We looked at how every step of that journey was another piece of path Jesus was clearing for us so that we might follow him into life. Now each week we look at the Last Supper as the beginning of that final section of trail. And to help us to, to remember that, we normally turn to Matthew, Mark, or Luke. However, this week I found the Gospel of John to be most fascinating when it comes to the Passover meal. John doesn't even record the account of Jesus eating with the disciples. But he does place a great emphasis on connecting Jesus with the Passover. John 19, 28 through 30 reads, After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch, and they held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. John is the only gospel writer that records this detail of the wine being offered to Jesus, Jesus on a hyssop branch. And if you read John, it's really clear to see he doesn't include details like this on accident. They serve a purpose. In adding this detail, he's activating the memory of that first night, that first Passover. He's calling his Jewish readers to remember back to the very beginning of this trail that God has been breaking for them for generations. Remember where it started and see now that it is finished. I think like David said this morning, it's not the trail they expected, but it's the only trail that would work. Amen. Jesus has become the Passover lamb. His blood has been dipped in hyssop. It's now covering the doorposts, and a path through death has been made and is now available to all. There is, however, one more detail from that first night, a detail that Jesus invites us to remember today. Sacrificing the lamb and covering the doorpost in blood is just the beginning. The Israelites are instructed to remain in their house until the morning. Death is passing through outside. Life can be found inside. If they sacrificed the lamb and covered the door but went outside, death would find them. Yet if they remained inside, they would enjoy life. Jesus tells us to remain in him. He is the way, the truth, the life. When he gives his body for us, he tells us to take this meal in remembrance of him. He invites us inside to walk through the doorpost covered in his blood to enjoy the path of life that he has broken for us. I'd like to say a prayer for the body and the blood separately this morning, so would you bow with me, please? Jesus, we thank you that you have broken a trail for us and you offered up your very body to do that. It was only through your death that a path to life could be made. 
We thank you that your broken body now gives our bodies wholeness. And we pray that you'll be with us as we remember this now. For it's in you we pray. Amen. The body of Christ. Let's pray again. Father, we come, we remember that life represents blood. Our blood represents life for us. We thank you that you have provided this cup. You have provided this blood that covers the door that we can now enter through. And we can now enjoy life in you. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. The blood of Christ. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you have been blessed, and today it's just the beginning because we've got a lot more coming. Uh, we hope you'll stick around, first of all, for classes that start at 1030. And if you haven't done so already, we encourage you to um, make your offering today. You can do that online at nscoc.org slash give. Text message 210-940-4401. You can mail a check, or you can drop an envelope in one of the offering boxes in the back. The Children's and the Youth Ministry are excited to announce something new called Intergenerational Prayer Partners. This is an opportunity to our entire congregation that will pair members and families to be prayer partners for a designated amount of time. Uh, stay tuned for more details coming in May <clears throat> and for signups to begin in June. Like I said, there's a lot going on today. Our spring fellowship will, will follow our classes today. For those that purchased a missions meal in advance, that meal can, will be served from noon to one back here at the kitchen. You can pick up your meal there and then you're welcome to eat in the fellowship room. The egg hunt rotation will begin at 1 p.m. and you didn't have to sign up for this, so you can just show up and enjoy. Um, tonight, the YG will be meeting at the MacArthur Park Church of Christ for our youth area-wide from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. Dinner will be provided for the youth at no cost. However, transportation is not provided, so parents, you're welcome to stick around for worship if you'd like. And this week, as David said, there are no Wednesday night activities at all up here at the building, but we hope you will join us for our Good Friday service at 7 p.m. upstairs in the youth room. Now, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching, and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. Rise up, O church of God, have done with lesser things. Give heart and mind and soul and strength to serve the King of Kings. Rise up, O Church of God, His kingdom tarries long. Bring in the day of brotherhood and end the night of wrong. Rise up, O sons of God, church for you doth wait. Her strength unequal to her task. Rise up and make her great. Lift high the cross of Christ. Tread where his feet have trod. As followers of the Son of Man, rise up, O church. 
in peace. Thank you.